just want to thank y'all, everyone, so much for being here. Thank, um, thank y'all, students, man, for, for for dedicating your Friday night to this. Like this is so awesome, man. And uh, you know, the thing I've been telling everyone is, man, this thing is just as much for non-believers as it is for believers. So if you're a non-believer, if you're an atheist, if you're an agnostic, if you're a Muslim, if you're a Buddhist, like whatever you are, um, maybe you don't even care. Man, thank you so much for being here, man. Because this is for you too. And so, for those of y'all that haven't ever been to church before, maybe haven't even prayed before, nothing, um, I just want to let you know that, uh, man, you're probably going to see some things here, and, and you're probably going to feel, so, feel, feel some weird things going on in, in your emotions, and your spirit, and everything, but I want you to know, man, that it's love. The King of Kings loves you. And so before I start talking, before I start going, I don't want to screw this up, so let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, God, I thank you so much for every single soul in here. Every single mind, every single body, every emotion, every talent. God, I ask right now that you completely take over anything that goes on here. God, that everything, God, just, just breathe a fresh breath of life into each and every one of us, God. Make those who don't know you know you. Meet them. Find them. I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, man, so, so real quick, I'm going to start off. Um, yeah, let's do it. All right, so Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. I'm just going to go one scripture, and then we're going to roll. So... All right, it says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is a gift of God, the gift of God. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. So, man, I'm going to start off by, by just challenging um, and, just, and just kind of going after this thing. So, real quick, uh, can I just give you permission? Can we be real tonight? Yes. yes. Can, I mean, can we be real honest right now? Yes. All right, man, let's do it. Because I think for far too long, man, the reason some of you are here right now, man, have never stepped foot in a, in a church in your entire life is because I believe that American Christianity and just cultural Christianity has screwed everything up. And it, it has deceived our perception of who God is. And so I want you to know, man, that, man, maybe you're here right now. You said we can be real. Maybe you're here right now, and, and you're gay. And, man, you feel hated by, by every single Christian that you've ever come across. Because it's all they do is point fingers and judge. And say, yeah, you're a sinner. You're going to burn in hell unless you, unless you turn. You better confess with your mouth right now. You better say this prayer with me right now. Or you're going to go to hell. That's not who God is. God loves each and every single one of you. No matter what you've been through. I don't care if you got high as a kite before you walked into this room, man. God still loves you. I don't care if you had sex last night at a party. God still loves you. Man, that verse, it's, it's not by our own works. It's a gift from God. Nothing we do, we, we cannot work for it at all. 2,000 years ago, Jesus paid for it on the cross. And so one thing I want you to know, man, is I'm not, I'm not someone up here who, who just knows it all. You know, been in church his whole life, has it all figured out. No. <laughs> uh, so, so I want to share with you uh, my testimony in, in a little bit and just, just how, um, how I came to, to, to be standing here right now and the reason that I'm still standing here right now. I grew up in Arlington, Texas. I was born in Granbury, moved to Arlington uh, when I was a baby, a little kid, don't really remember. Um, lived with my dad and now my ex-stepmom right now, uh, now my ex-stepmom, lived with them and uh, I would go see my mom on the weekends and stuff. And real quick, both my parents are saved now, so it's a story of grace for them too, so praise God for that.
but this is before all of us who knew who Jesus was. Okay, we, we were not schools. Um, and so, so, yeah, so I grew up, man, I, I was a pretty pudgy little kid. I was overweight. I was bigger than everyone else, so I was really good at football. <laughs> because I was good. <laughs> uh, now, I'm average height. It's kind of sad, but oh well. So, so I grew up, um, I grew up pretty, pretty confused and pretty, I had a lot of anger built inside of me. Like a lot. Um, I grew up, like I said, I struggled with my, with my weight a lot. Um, like, I, I wear the same waist size I do now as I did in my fifth grade. Like, I was, I was, I was pretty big. Um, and so, you know, I would go through it, and, and day after day, man, it seemed like it was always an uphill battle. Like, maybe some of y'all, man, does, does, does every day feel like an uphill battle? Yeah. Like, every single day. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Every day I woke up, man, and, and me and my stepmom, we just butt heads all the time. Could not stand each other. We loved each other, but we, we couldn't, we just couldn't get along. You know, I grew up, you know, she, she'd tell me things like, oh, you're, you're fat. You're, you're a slob, you know, you're, you're gonna, because I would lash out in anger because of these things, you know, and she would tell me things like, why are you so angry? You know, you're gonna go, you're going to be such an angry person, you know, and all this stuff. And it was constant, constant, always bashing and bashing and bashing. And I felt so bad for my dad because my dad was just kind of stuck in the middle. And I praise God that he stayed around because I know there's a lot of you, man, your dad's not here right now. And I want you to know that your Heavenly Father loves you. Way more than any earthly father ever could. And so, man, I grow up just angry all the time. And, man, some days, I'd sit there in my room, man. I would wonder, what if I wasn't here? Like, what would it be like if I just ended it? I know whether you're open to admit it or not, and I'm not attacking you, but I'm saying I'm here with you. I know there's some of y'all right here that thought that same night, that same thought last night. What if I wasn't here? Man, does anyone really care? Is there even a God out there? Because if there was, why am I so depressed? Why am I so angry all the time? Why do I keep on looking at that thing? I just can't shake it. It's always in my head. These thoughts, these voices telling me to end it. They won't go away. But I wasn't free. Because I lived for myself. So I grew up, man, confused and angry and stuff, and then... Um, my mom, you know, she had a really, really, really rough childhood growing up, so the way, her way of dealing and coping with that was through pain pills and alcohol. Don't know what hydrocodone is? That was a big thing, man. Like I said, my mom's set free from all this right now, so praise God. But that was her way of dealing with stuff, was being messed up all the time. And so, like, that's, that's the mother that, that, I, that I always, that I knew, you know, and as, as an eight-year-old, I didn't want to admit that my mom was messed up all the time. You know, me and my older brothers, we'd argue all the time. She'd be like, Chris, well, you know, mom's always messed up, but I did that, and that, you know, and no, she's not, she, you know, whatever. And, and finally, when I, when I got old enough, you know, I, I became angry and hardened towards that. So I cut my relationship off with her. Didn't talk to her for about a year. Bitter, angry inside. Sixth grade year, my stepmom, my dad split up. She goes out the house. What do you think, man? Like... His wife just left him. He's going through some stuff. So, you know, he, he would go out a lot, and, and he never abandoned me or anything, you know, but he, he would go out a lot. He always had, you know, a cup of wine in his hand and stuff, and, and, and I felt really, really alone in those moments. I would sit on my, in my bedroom on my knees and cry, God, where are you? Why? Just why? <coughs> so the uh, you know years goes by and summer of my sixth grade year or the, the spring break of my sixth grade year right before spring break I talked to my mom for the first time in like a year have a conversation with her 
and we decide that I'm going to go over to her house to, uh, to visit her for spring break. So I go over there, everything seems cool. Um, you know, she's, she's dating this guy named Zach, and I'm like, oh, you know what, this is actually really cool over here, you know? And so I go, and I go home, and I tell my dad, hey, um, I want to move in with my mom. And, of course, he's devastated, as anyone should be. And he says, well, you're old enough to make that decision, so I'm going to let you go. So I go and I move here to Granbury, Texas, my sixth grade year after spring break. Come in, still a numbskull kid. Uh, I go around and um, GMS, where my GMS squad at? I love y'all too, like this. Um, so we're, we're, you know, going on GMS, right? Hey, we hard at GMS, right? Hey. No, not really. We're, we're a bunch of dumb schools who think we're hard, okay? We're not from the hood, we're from Hood County, okay? And so, so you know, we're going, and, and, and it's like maybe, you know, seven weeks left of school or something. So I don't really get the whole school experience. I kind of get in, I don't really make a whole lot of deep, deep friends. Um, and so I go, and summer goes by, and it's like super, super hot. Um, the house we were living at the time was like, a tin box that had like no insulation and no air conditioning and you sit there watching cops and you start sweating, you know, not because the show, because it's hot, physically hot. And uh, and so, you know, but, but in, in reality though, man, like I was I was angry, I was still so, so lost. And so, me, me and this guy named Zach Collins, boyfriend at the time, you know, me and him would go back and forth, he'd tell me how disrespectful I was, and I'm like, dude, you don't even go to work, what are you talking about? And so, you know, we go back and forth, and I, I tell my mom one night, I remember walking out on the front porch, outside in the front, and I said, Mom, look, either he's got to go or I'm going to go. Keep in mind, this before I knew Jesus. And so, months go by, and then, you know, I used to go to my older brother's house to kind of get away from things, and one day, my mom's coming to pick me up from my older brother's house, and my older brother's name was Nick and Kyle, and I said, man, Nick, Kyle, I don't want to go back, man. So, you know, they, they, they were always there for me, you know. When, when I lacked guidance or, or just, just love from other people, like my, my two older brothers were always there for me. And, you know, maybe they weren't, they didn't always show me, who, they never showed me who Jesus was, you know. They never gave me guidance or anything, but they were always there for me, you know. And so, I go to my grandmother's house where I live now, and cops get called and stuff, and I get put in the cop car, and they take me back, you know, because I ran away. Um, and... Two weeks later, we go to court. And sorry if I stay with me, please. Y'all yeah, still wake up there? Just check. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So we're going, and uh, we go to court. My grandparents get custody, and seventh grade starts. My first real year GMS. I'm still in school. So we go, and uh, middle of my seventh grade year. Me and this girl, we start doing some really, really dumb things that we shouldn't have been doing, and I get in deep, deep trouble for it. Big trouble. Um, I almost went to juvie because of it. And literally, by the grace of God, like, all I got was two days of ice sets. And it could have been, like, literally, I'm not even joking, you could, it should have been a felony on my record. Legally. And so, you thank God, well, there it is. You came to know the Lord right there. No way, Jose, I was still all about myself. So I go and keep on living, man. Eighth grade comes around. Well, you know, I don't know how it is in AMS, but what do you get into a GMS when, when you're all about yourself and all about the hype and all about partying? Drugs and alcohol. So that's what me and my buds got into. Some of these dudes sitting over here, they were there with me through that. And man, we, on the weekends, we figured, all right, man, well, hey, I'm, because this is what the world tells us, right? Hey, man, I'm a smart kid. I'm in pretty few classes. I'm going to go to college. I'm a good football player. Hey, man, as long as I keep my stuff together, I can do whatever I want on the weekends, right? So, man, every weekend, I go, I drink. <laughs> there'd be weed, there'd be pills being cut up, and, and, and bottles of alcohol everywhere. And, man, I was just like, yes, this is life. <laughs> no. Wrong. And so. At this point, I'm not even talking to my dad and my mom anymore because I'm angry with them, still. And so in the midst of my loss and my confusion and my pain, two girls, they're in the crowd here. After I say their names, I want you to give it up for them. Callie, Callie Anderson and Taylor Parrish, give it up for them. Be 
because man, like every single week, like throughout the year, maybe not every single week, but man, like time and time again throughout the year, hey, maybe you should come check out Elevate. I'm not advertising our church saying it's better than anybody's church, you know, but I'm just saying this is my story. Hey, man, you should come to Elevate. You should come check it out. Ah, man, maybe next week or something, you know? And, and also, man, Stockton Barry, man. Give it up for Stockton real quick, too. So, so Stockton, right, he invites me over to his church. It was my first time I had a, had a youth service, and I was like, and so, you know, and Callie, and Callie and Taylor, they, they invite me and they went over to Elevate. And one week, I'm like, all right, I'll go. And so Callie and her and Callie's mom, they come and pick me up after my one-act play practice. And we go to Elevate. And this man, he's also here. His name is Dennis Funderburg. He was the one preaching. And his message was, why is my family so dysfunctional? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> right, <laughs> A little weird. Uh, so I get real hot in there, you know what I'm saying? Holy, holy Spirit. And so I'm like, dude, this guy's talking to me. Like, he's talking to me. That's, what'd you say about my mama? You know? And it was like, and so, and so, you know, he's, he's speaking, and I'm like, dude, this is crazy. And so, you know, we go by, and man, during worship, uh, there's a song called All He Says I Am, my favorite worship song still to this day, man. And, and, the, and the lyrics say, chains are broken, scales are on the floor, truth is spoken, I'm no orphan anymore. Tears, gone, I was done. <laughs> and man, that night, I said, Jesus, you can have it all, dude. All my depression, all my suicidal thoughts, all my addictions, even my relationships with my friends, I guarantee you, man, just real quick, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to the Christians real quick. Non-believers, man, you, you, can, you can chill back and, you know, you're off the hook in this, but you can kind of just listen in on this, but, but Christians, man, I promise you, if, if, you, if you've been living in this thing for four years and you're still, you still are friends with every single person that is still living in the world, uh, unless you're discipling to them, if you're just chilling back, I promise you, you're not running the race. Because, man, like, it, there, there's a price that, you're, that, that we still pay, but Jesus paid it. And so, you know, I come to know who Jesus is, and I, that man, that night was so powerful. I said, God, please just take it off from me. In my head, I'm thinking, dude, when I go back to school, everyone's going to love me. Um, I'm going to be the most popular dude because I'm a Christian now. <laughs> No way. And I started going, you know, it, it, I, was, I was new to the faith, so I was a little more aggressive than I should have been, obviously. And, and so, you know, I'm going, I'm not, I'm not about that life, man. I'm not about that no more, you know. And, um, I remember I told uh, one of my friends, his name is Ryan, not Slate, sorry, Slate, um, different Ryan. And I tell him, I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm going to try not cussing for 30 days. Like five minutes later, I drop an F bomb. Dang it. <laughs> but God still loved me. He's not, he's, he's not about like, all right, sir, you shall rise every time my, my word is read, and you shall no, no longer cuss. Um, you shall no longer watch Family Guy. Oh, come on. Now, don't get me wrong. Hey, man, like, I'm not saying to watch these things. I'm not advertising these things, but I'm saying God thought about your works. Because if you follow him, he's going to he's gonna be the one doing the transforming. All you got to do is say, God, have me. And so, man, my point in all of that is to say that no matter where you're at, no matter what you've done, no matter how depressed you are right now, what deep, dark stuff is going on in your heart and your mind right now that no one knows about, men, Man, you're a youth leader, and you're addicted to pornography. Ladies, you're a youth leader, but you read all that gossip and all that crap every single day. I want you to know that God knows your heart. He knows every single thing about you, but he loves you. So, so much. So much that 
that Jesus, Yeshua, the Son of God, came down from the throne, and this is a king, people, this is a king we're talking about, came down from the throne, out of heaven, came to the earth, born as a little baby, grew up, he's about 30 years old, did three years of ministry, and the whole time, man, he was looking forward to one thing, his death. He knew that one day was going to come. Remember, those soldiers were going to come and they were going to capture him. They were going to beat him. They were going to rip the skin, the flesh, the tissue off of his back. He was going to have his, his wrist pierced, his feet pierced, marred beyond any man had been before. You couldn't even recognize him. Stripped naked and humiliated in front of people, man. The people that he loved so dearly. You know what they said? The ones that Jesus came for and said, man, I love you. Rise up. Walk. Leprosy. Gone. Blind eye. See. Those people that he healed, that he loved, you know what they said? Crucify him. Kill him. Every single one of us, whether you're there right now, or whether you've been there before, every single one of us, man, that's us. You know, God, I know you're probably out there, but honestly, I just don't care. God, I know that you saved me when I was nine years old, but you know, God, like, man, I really, really love this girl. And I know that, I, that I'm not supposed to be with her, but, but God, I love her. I'm going to walk this way. Every single time. We're the ones spitting in his face. even though he loved us. But man, it's, it's not a story of, judge, of judgment. It's not a story of, well guys, we're done. We're lost. No, man. He loves you. Really loves you. Non-believers right now, I'm going to talk to you, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand or do anything weird or uncomfortable, but right now, non-believers, I want to tell you right now, man, that first of all, I apologize on behalf of the whole entire church that has ever, ever hurt you in any way. That has ever talked down to you. That has ever said, you're not good enough to step foot in our building. Sorry, sweetie. Your shorts are too short. Get out. None of that, man. That's not who Jesus is. He literally hung out with prostitutes. Man, there's a story in the Bible where this, this, this woman is literally caught in the act of adultery. That means sex not with her husband. This woman is literally caught in it. That means she's probably naked or barely clothed, and she was literally caught in the act of sex. And man, these soldiers came and captured her. They ripped her up, pulled in her hair, and they, they come to Jesus. They find Jesus to test him, and they throw her on the floor in front of them. Say, Lord... What would you do? And they sit back and they and they wait. And Jesus, he gets down and he starts writing in the dirt. No idea what he wrote. Doesn't tell us that. But he writes it. He stands up. And man, in my head, I just imagine that. I just imagine the soldiers, like, the look on their face, you know. 
because of what Jesus wrote, they're probably like, dang, dude. <laughs> this guy's a jit. <laughs> and Jesus says, let him who has no sin throw the first stone. One by one. All these stones drop. Because they had stones ready to literally kill them. They're gone. And Jesus says, Woman, who's here to condemn you? No one, Lord. Go, for, go forth and sin no more. Grace, right there. She was literally on the brink of death. Some would even argue rightfully so, because that was the law back then. <coughs> Jesus said, no, 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 no. I choose her. I love her. I'm going to ask the Christians a question real quick. Because I know some of y'all, man, right now, you've already kind of mentally checked out, maybe. Yeah, I've heard this a million times. Yeah, I, I mean, I care, but, you know, I've, I've heard it a bunch, you know? You know, if you've been in church for a year, I'm sure you've heard it quite a bit. But, man, I want to challenge you with something. I'm going to ask you something. When was the last time that you shared that love with someone? <coughs> not stood up on stage with the microphone, not led with the keyboard and the microphone, play drums, not stood in a street corner with a sign that says turn or burn, God hates bags, no. When was the last time that you walked up to someone, looked them in the eyes, and saw them the way the king sees them, and said, man, I want you to know that God loves you? No, man, well, you know, about the Jesus, no, man, but look, I understand I'm not here to judge you, man, but I want you to know that Jesus, like, loves you. So much that he, he, he got up on a cross and died to set you free. Oh, man, thanks. Yeah, man, I need you Because I promise you, man, this gospel, real quick side note for, for those who maybe, you know, you've heard the word gospel, you, you don't really know what it means, but gospel literally means good news, okay? The gospel, like when you hear the gospel, the gospel is not the Bible. The gospel is not Christian. The gospel is the good news of Jesus. And he got up, you know, it's pretty, you present it how, however, but accurate. You know, Jesus got up and he died, and three days later he resurrected. And that's where we find our victory. You know, that's where he forgives us. That's the gospel. And I promise you, this gospel, man, is not about, it is not about persuasion. All it's about is proclamation. You don't have to talk anyone into believing in Jesus. You don't go from the throat with a knife, you know. Repent. <laughs> no, dude. You just got you just gotta lay it out before them. Hey man, this is what happened, God loves you. They do what they want. A couple months ago in spring break, man. Me and my friends we were eating where we sadly often eat Taco Bell. And uh it, it was like eleven o'clock at night. It was like me, Trevor, Haley, Isaiah, Ben, Chloe? Yes. I think Chloe was there. Sorry, Chloe. Um, 
anyway, so, so we're going, it's like 11 o'clock, we pull up and and uh, I, look, I look across the street, so y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Like Walmart's right next to it. Mm -hmm. And in between, there's a little grass thing, and then there's a little Walmart gas station right there. <coughs> yeah, so just give me a visual, sorry. And so the, there's a truck with its hazard lights on. I'm like, okay, well obviously still in the truck, uh, you know, someone's having some truck issues, so. I'm like, hey, do I need help? Yeah, man, come, come here real quick. All right, Trevor, get your jumper cables, come on, let's go. So get his jumper cables, and y'all need jumper cables? No. Alright, put him back, Trevor. So just as I'm going to, to turn around and to go back and feel this little tug in my heart, walk over there. Just walk over there. Just see what happens. She's really excited when God says that. So I go over there. And I'm like, is there anything I can do? And I'm walking over there. I'm still in the parking lot. I'm like, is there anything I can do? They're like, yeah, can you come help us push it? I start, you know, running over there. That was weird. Uh, start running over there, and um, you know, as, as I get over there, the car, they, they start getting the car pushed, of course, and I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm useless. All right. Before I go, one more shot. Is there anything, you know, I'm over there in the parking lot now with them, is there anything I can do at all? And this, this awesome Walmart employee, his name's Colton, works in the gas station. You ever see a Walmart employee in the gas station named Colton? Tell him, what's up, man? Um, super nice guy. And uh, he was like, well, honestly, unless you know anything about cars, I don't know anything about cars. He goes, unless you know anything about cars, I guess the only thing you can, uh, I can think of is give him a ride. So I'm like, all right. Go for the guy. Had to be in his like, late 40s. And obviously, you know, we live in Granbury, huge meth central. And so you see quite the, quite the number of, of drug users. And sometimes it can be intimidating. You know, and I walk up and the guy's really, you know, skinny and all tatted up and bald and wearing a wife beater. You know, it could have been a white supremacist. And I'm a brown kid walking up to him, you know. And so, <laughs> And so, you know, I go up and I'm like, I'm like, hey man, uh, you need a ride? Just a little old me, you know? And he's like, and he's like, oh well, you know, where I'm going, it's it's pretty far. It's like, all right, but where is it at? Fort Worth. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's it's like 11:30 at this point, you know, and I'm like, what are we gonna do, God? You know, and I'm sitting there, and okay, I'm just here for a reason, obviously. And so I just go for it. Yeah, I'll give you a ride. Sounds completely irresponsible. Parents, I'm sorry, I'm not advertising your kid to do this, but, um, and so, that's cool, man, like, God still works with stuff like that, he's so cool. And so, uh, I go back and uh, he goes, are y'all gonna go eat? Yeah, sadly, I'm gonna go get myself some Taco Bell. And uh, he goes, all right, well, it gives me time to make a phone call. I'm like, okay, that sounds sketchy, but all right. So I start going over here, and I go in, and, I, and I'm standing out at Isaiah's house, and I'm like, hey, Isaiah. Uh, can you uh, can you call your mom and ask her if you can you can come with me? I'm thinking no way in the world is she gonna let me. <laughs> and he calls her, hey mom. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Can me uh, can me and Chris go take this guy to to rehab and forth? <laughs> yeah. All right, sweet, all right, all right. Yeah, and she said yeah. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. And so you know, I'm sitting there, and I'm shaking, and I'm nervous because and man, and, and and I know all y'all Christians, man, say every day. Man, I would lay my life down for this thing. Yeah, man, if someone pointed a gun right now and said, do you believe? I'd say, yeah, dude. <laughs> but then, like, you go day in and day out. Like, without saying a single word, I don't know how it adds up. But, uh, and so, you know, I'm sitting there, man, and I'm like, dude, like, I could literally lose my life tonight. This is a guy in Granbury, Texas at Walmart at midnight, taking a dude to Fort Worth in rehab. Whoa. And I'm, I'm shaking, dude. I'm like, I don't know about this man. You know, Isaiah has a little dash and smile. He's like, Yeah, man, I'm excited. Are you kidding me, dude? And so I'm shaking, you know, you know, I'm like, All right, man, well, I guess, you know, you know let's do it. So we prayed, and, and Haley, Haley McLean, you know, being the, the loving figure, she's like, All right, guys, make sure you call me, you know, when you're there and stuff. And make sure you check in. Like, All right, Haley, thank you. Thank you so much. Like, no, no, for real. Okay, yeah, thank you. And so, uh, you know, we go back and the guy's like, all right, man, well, I got everything I own right here in these boxes. <sighs> all right, man, let's do it. You know, we'll, you know, and so, uh, so we get the guy's stuff and we walk over and I'm like, all right, bro, I got to be real with you. Um, do you have anything on you? He's like, no, sir. Uh, here's my driver's license. Here's my social security card. And here's my birth, you know, not really, but he started handing me all the stuff and he's like, lifting his shirt up, showing me he doesn't have anything, you know, and I'm like, all right, all right, you know, cool, cool. And so, uh, he gets in and we start driving. And 
What do you do when you're in that situation, right? What do you do? I mean, that's a genuine, like, wonder. What am I supposed to do? I mean, some of y'all some, some Christians, man, like, y'all... I don't know how to share the gospel. I don't know how to approach someone. I have no idea. I'm not qualified to do it because I'm too dirty. I'm too sinful. Don't fly to yourself. You're not the one who says who God is. And so, like, I did what all I knew how to do, you know? I don't don't have a great, you know, I don't have a degree in theology or haven't read the whole Bible. Like, I don't, you know, I'm in the Word, but, you know, I, there's a lot of smarter dudes out there than I am, you know? But I share all I know, and that's my relationship with who Jesus is. So we start talking to him, and I start pouring my heart out of the story I, I told y'all earlier, and, and then Isaiah starts pouring his heart, about, heart out about, you know, how, how his dad just walked out. Just walked out from his family, man. Come to find out, quote unquote, coincidentally, this guy that we're talking to was a failing father. Needed to hear that, man. And so we're sitting there talking, man, and he's in the back seat just bawling, just crying. But man, I know y'all are sent from God because. Like, I know that I'm supposed to do this because everything y'all are saying, man, like, I, I need to hear it. He tells us, man, he started drugs when he was 13 years old when his mom died. He's been addicted to heroin. He's been in prison since he was 17 years old. This guy's had a horror, dude. And we're just two brown kids from Granberry. <laughs> yeah. And so... We're going, in, and he just starts just crying. He starts pouring his heart out, you know. We're, we're putting, you know, I'm driving, wiping my tears away while driving, you know, and listen to the GPS and unsafe, but God, man. Um, and so we're going, and and uh, we get there, man. We get out, and we pray with him. And this, at this point, he's completely transformed, dude. Like he's not. His his eyes are lighting them. He's like, man, thank y'all, man. And so we get out, and we pray with him and stuff, and. All right, man. Yes, this is goodbye. We give him a hug. Five hugs. <laughs> we go back, man. And me and Isaiah shut the door and sit down. It's one in the morning. Oh. We're in Arlington, Texas right now. And that just happened. That's God, dude. That's God's love. If God can reach his hand down, his almighty hand that we're so scared of because he strikes people down and because he, he sends them to hell to burn for eternity, if that same God can reach his hand down and snatch up the heroin after he's been in prison since he was 17 years old and has been a horrible father to his three-year-old daughter and forgive him, I promise he can forgive you. So I want you to know something, man, like, we've been praying for this thing, man, and prayer, real quick, too, man, prayer is not some, oh, heavenly father, hello, be the, hello, be the, you know, whatever, you know, you don't have to be proper and eloquent to speak to God, he just wants to talk to you, dude. And there's been prayers where, where someone literally drops the F-bomb in the middle of their prayer. God's not, oh, never mind, can't hear it, sorry. No, dude. He's genuine. He loves you. He doesn't want you to go get yourself cleaned up and then step foot into this church and, all right, God, I'm here, I'm ready. No, dude, he wants you right now where you are, in your dirt, in your mess, in your depression, in your hopelessness, in everything. He wants you where you are right now. <coughs> Man, he, he hung there bleeding. Okay, real quick. When, when you look at crucifixion, right? So, so from, from an anatomy standpoint of crucifixion, okay? It's not just, oh, man, well, he got spikes in his hands and he kind of waited there until he died. No, he literally suffocated to death. 
hanging there from a cross by nails, crowned with thorns, and in going into his skull. And so when he's sitting here like this, his lungs are scientifically, they're stuck in the inhale position. And so he can't get any breath out. So every time he needs to breathe, he pulls himself up by those nails, digging deeper and deeper. <sighs> Falls back down, pulling. Literally, the person on the left of him on the cross <coughs> taunted him. Said, well, you're the son of God, why don't you just use your power and get down? No, dude. You know why? Because Jesus knew you. Because Jesus knew one day that you're going to be sitting in the seat where you are right now dealing with that addiction. Dealing. Man. What if I wasn't here? And he hung there, blood pouring out of his head. His wounds on his back, rubbing against that wood. And at the very end, he said the greatest words of all time. In the midst of all this, the suffering, the confusion, the pain, it is finished. And he gave his soul up. You know, they, they, they took the, the spear and then just from a scientific standpoint, okay? So some people think, well, what, what if Jesus didn't actually die? Like, what if he just passed out? What the, what the soldiers would do, well, they'd take a spear and they would poke it in, in his side, his ribs right here. And if the fluid came out, the water and the blood, that's a sign of, of, of death by suffocation. So they, comes out. Oh, he's dead. Take him down. They take him and they bury him in the tomb. And the next day, silence. All the people, his disciples that he's been following him this whole time, seeing all these miracles. Man, could you imagine this from their standpoint? Seeing all these miracles. Hearing about all these great things that the Almighty God was going to do, and now he's dead. And I know some of you Christians feel like that sometimes. Man, I was in that service, man, and, and God, you said you were going to set me free. You said you were going to use me in a mighty way. Where are you? Why are you silent right now? Next day, that stone rolled away. The tomb empty. <laughs> King was back, man. And he walks for forty days. Scars, holes still there, <clears throat> gashing aside still there, but walking. And then he said, you know what? I know this is gonna suck for you guys, but I gotta go. Because if I don't go, then he can't come. Who's he? The Holy Spirit. The one who comforts you. The one who moves through you. The one when you're seeing oceans, you know, tears motion. That presence you feel? Holy Spirit. Man, if he didn't go, we, we, he, you know, he wouldn't be here. And so then he goes. And from that point on, it begins. The world that we're walking in right now. 
And so I know some of y'all right now, y'all questioning, right? Well, well, if God's so loving, if you if you sit up there and you say, God's so loving that he loves me, then then why why are there starving children dying right now? Why did that man murder my uncle? Why did my cousin not come home from service? The answer? Us. Man. Every single one of us are fallen. Every single one of us. I'm imperfect, you're imperfect. Pastors, they're imperfect. <coughs> It's because of our failure that we suffer. And it's because of a deceiver. What I'm about to talk about, this, this is weird, man. Because I promise you, if you believe in God and angels, you better believe in Satan and demons. Not weird, scary. <laughs> no, but I mean, I mean, I mean, those apart from Christ, those hearing those voices in your head to end it. Those of you apart from Christ, dealing with that that weight pulling down your heart right now, telling you you're not good enough. Aren't you just pick up that gun? And end it right now. <coughs> Guys? Man, you, you gotta be stronger. Man, get up, get up in the morning and look at yourself in the mirror every single day. It's never gonna be good enough. Ever, I promise you. Your bench max is gonna go up and up and up and up. It's never gonna be good enough. But man, those, those liars want to get in your head and they're going to tell you that because of that, you're going to find by that, you're not good enough. But I promise you, God says, no! You're my child. Come to me. I want y'all to know, man. This event right now, Revive, it's not about me. It's not about the cool band. It's not about the lights. It's not about this beautiful auditorium. It's about a movement of power and love. Man, last semester, like I was sitting in my room dealing with some hardcore depression, dude. I don't know if I'm good enough. I really don't. I can't do this. My best friends, I don't know where they're at because they're lost out there in the world right now and they said they were going to be there forever. But man, I'm here right now by myself and it's dark in here. It's dark and it's cold in here. God, you promised me things were going to be so great. Where are you now? Guys, that was six months ago. God gave me this vision. Lane, God, what do I do right now? God, even though I feel so, so dead right now, even though I feel so cold right now, God, where are you? What do I do? Give me this vision, man. Get this get together. Invite every single student you know. Every single person, no matter where they're at. Whether they're a Christian. Whether they're an atheist. No matter where they're at. Gather them together. And together, come to know my love. It's like, oh man. All right, God, you know how to do this? I use Pastor Ty. Ty, what do I do? Tell him. Yeah, that, that can be possible. That's not very reassuring. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think everything's possible, you know. Um, 
And, you know, he gives me some advice to me. He tells me one thing that, man, I hold, I held on to forever. And he said, if it's God's will, it's never going to fail. So I want you to know right now, man, last summer, if you were at camp, some conference, some service or whatever, and you came to the front, you said, God, use me in a big way. And you heard a whisper of God saying, yes, I'll use you. I promise it will not fail. Ready or not, he's coming. He's coming tonight. Whether you're dead asleep right now, whether you're burning wide awake right now, man, ready, jumping up and down, throwing the beach balls, crying during worship, man, where you're at, man, dude, he's coming. Some of the greatest words, man. This guy named John the Baptist, right? So this guy named John the Baptist, he literally, this is before Jesus came, right? So he's out in the wilderness, like that's like the, the jungle, you know, like no one's there. Uh, this guy's crazy. So he goes out there, he's eating like wild honey and dressing in this like, you know, animal fur and just, you know? God literally calls him out in the middle of nowhere. That's like, that means not here, like all this right here, like it's easy to talk to y'all, right? Because it's like, all right, people are listening to me. He goes out in the middle of nowhere. And you know, I imagine he goes out there and, oh my God, I don't know what I'm doing here, but uh, <clears throat> all or nothing. Uh, hey! Is anyone there? No. Okay, great. Repent for the kingdom is, of God is at hand. There's someone coming who's going to set you free from your sin. There's someone coming who's going to deliver you from your hopelessness. And you know, I just imagine like a group of us kids are kind of walking, you know, and we're like, what is that? Is it? All right, let's go check out what this dude has to say. He's kind of crazy. Let's go see. <laughs> go over there. And, and this guy, man, he's just pouring his heart out. Pouring the, uh, by the way, that's the football guy's name, the baseball game. It's cool. Um, love y'all. Um, <laughs> Y'all still with me, by the way? Yes. Cool. Y'all get loud real quick. Just get loud real quick. Those are my friends. <laughs> and, uh, so man, like, like he's sitting here and he's eating all this wild honey and, and being weird and crazy and all these, all of a sudden people start gathering around him. And he's sitting there, man, and he, 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 starts, he starts baptizing people, man, because God told him to. Baptize them in water. Set them for, for the remission of their sins. He starts baptizing them. And here he comes, man, up on the hill. John looks over him. Jaw drops. And he says the words that shook history forever. Behold! The Lamb of God who has come to take away the sin of the world. So I want you to know right now, man, he's here. No matter where, I know I've said it over and over, man, but I want you to understand, I want you to get this in your head, man, no matter where you're at, he loves you. You're never too far gone. Never. Some of y'all, man, y'all feel shunned away by the church. Y'all feel shunned away from Christianity. You say you don't believe in God, but man, you hate God because he's angry at you, right? He loves you. Christians, if you're falling, his hands down, grab it. He's going to pull you up. Man, so I know I'm pretty early right now, uh, but man, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask the band to come back out here for a minute. Uh, well, not for a minute, for you know, come back out here. Um, 
and uh, yeah. awesome, awesome. <coughs> I want you to know, man, we are uh, we're about to go after this thing. Right now, I want you to know right now, like in the atmosphere right now, man, something's building right now. Man, if you don't feel it right now, if you're not aware of the presence, man, I know you're about to be. If you've never met God before, you're about to have an encounter with Him. So what I'm going to do, man, I'm going to offer, I'm going to offer a bunch of invitations. The first one, that was before I offer, man, I'm going to come down here for a second and just kind of... I want y'all to know, man, it does not take a big, huge, just awesome, awesome, just worker of God to get up here and, and, and to, to live the life. It's not about that, okay? Not one bit is about that. It's about His grace that He offers as a gift. Free. Freedom.
If you're a kid down here, man, man, you've always been a misfit, man. You, you know, you never fit in. Those kids always make fun of you, man. Maybe they don't make fun of you. Maybe you're the most popular dude in school right now. Maybe all the people love you, but at night you go home and you cry yourself to sleep because you're hopeless. If you've never put your life in the hands of God in faith, I'm going to ask you to come up here and join me real quick.
Jesus' name. Amen. I want y'all guys to know. Welcome home.